still not sure I ought to take this trip. Oh, come on now, Goodman. You asked me for the money to buy a new press, and you've been running hot and cold ever since. <laughs> a new press isn't going to do me any good if I get back here and there's no newspaper. Oh, you'd only be gone, what, less than a week. I just don't like the idea of turning it over to some young reporter who is brash and hot-headed. And... Now, now, look, I know he's young, and he's cocky, but I think he has every right to be. He writes a whole lot better than most people I've come across, and he's a good newspaper man. Well, I don't know about newspaper and but he sure tells great stories. <laughs> he sure does. Well... Now, Smiley used to keep this little beast in a little lattice box. Every once in a while, he'd fetch him into town and lay for a bed. One day, a fella, now he was a stranger in camp, he was, he saw him with his little box, and he said, Say, what do you got there in that there box? Well, Smiley, he just sort of indifferent like, says, Well, could be a parrot. Then again, it could be a canary. Maybe. But it ain't. It's only just a frog. Well, Sam. Mr. Carr, right, Jamie. Mr. Hey, Petey. How, How you doing? doing? Good to see you. Thank you. Tell him about the frog. No, well, uh, we'll get back to him. Right. Right. You yeah, make well. sure that these papers get to the proper saloon. See you later. Okay, Petey. Jamie, my friend, I hope you've been taking all my advice seriously. Now, always obey your pa when he's present. <laughs> And always do right, because it amazes most people. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> well, I got something to show you. What's that? How's it look? Pretty official? Samuel Clemens, editor pro tem. Yeah, it looks pretty official. It kind of surprises me, though, Sam. Knowing you, I figured you'd be using much bigger type. Well, I guess I was born modest. Oh, yeah. You know, not all over, but in spots. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, why don't we celebrate on it? Why don't we have a drink? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll have a little short one. Yeah. Well, I only drink myself to prevent toothache. I never had one, but I don't want to take any chances. Hey, Campbell. Hey. How about running over to the Silver Dollar and uh, bringing us back a bottle of whiskey? Oh. Oh, uh, what will I use for... Oh, I'm sure Mr. Carwright has the money handy. All right, Mr. Campbell, here. That ought to do it. I'll bring you back your change. I'll bring back the best whiskey. But for Mr. Cartwright. Oh, naturally. Naturally. <laughs> Sam, I sure appreciate your talent with the bottle. How are you doing as an editor? Well, I think I'm doing all right, considering it's my first day. What's this? How to steal with government help. It's another one of your funny stories, Sam. At times, somebody around these parts have asking questions of Mr. H.V. Prentice, a distinguished government affair. It's kind of strange that in less than a year, five new graves have been added to the Virginia City Boot Hill. Some awfully good friends of Mr. Prentice have filed rich claims. Sam Prentice has been a respected member of this community for more than 20 years. Are you saying he's involved in claim jumping and murder? Well, involved is a kind of fancy word, but it covers it. Son, that can't be true. Just can't be true. Now, how, how, how could you print a story like this? Well, this will ruin Goodman. You, you better have the proof. Well, somebody must be getting a little touchy. Well, it's nice to know people are reading the paper. in other people. Bert, hold Mr. Cartwright's drink. You know, Sam, that story you wrote for the Enterprise got this whole town turned upside down. Bert, maybe you ought to tell Mr. Cartwright about that. See, I used to have a cabin on Jackass Hill. He thinks there's some connection. <laughs> Where did you get that information for this story? Right over there. The man standing in the bar who was pretty upset about it. You know, sometimes drinking can be a big help. 
You're a lot more apt to get the truth out of a man in his cups than a sober citizen. How do you know this is the truth? Newspaper man has to have a nose for things like that, Mr. Cartwright. If he doesn't, he ought to buy himself a pick and shovel. Now, I was told he was a very reliable citizen. All right. Who is this reliable citizen? Never mind who. Anyway, he told me that an old miner staked out a claim right next to his. Seems this old geezer had struggled all the way through all the rat holes in the West, and he finally struck it rich. He got so excited, he wrote his wife to come on with the kids. Then he went over to Mr. Prentice at the assay office to register his claim. It's the last anybody ever saw of him. And a couple of days later, that same claim was filed in the name of a Mr. Jack McNabb. Jack McNabb? He, he's a dealer at the Lucky Nugget, and he works at all. A lot of other interesting claims this year, Mr. Cartwright. Billy Mulligan, Joe McGee, Hank Farmer, Jack Williams. Now, not one of those men would know gold if he ran across it in his own teeth. Well, it still doesn't implicate Prentice. I did a lot more checking as a reporter. Would you say that H.V. Prentice was a big spender? He's careful with his money. Careful? Now, he's the man alive who can remember when he bought anybody a drink. And he just bought a brand new spread and he paid for it in cash. I admit that does sound strange. I still think you should have real proof before you printed it in the paper. There are five unmarked graves in Virginia City Boot Hill, one for each claim. Now, how many more you want me to wait for? Sam, you owe me a responsibility. I guaranteed your job. Mr. Cartwright, I'm very grateful to you, but I don't tell you how to run to Ponderosa, because I wouldn't know one end of a calf from the other, and that's what you know about the newspaper business. Sam Clements. I had no problem figuring out where to find you. Uh, Clem? I'm glad to see you, Sheriff. I'm glad you dropped by. You saved me a trip. I'd like to swear out a complaint against H.V. Prentice, Jack McNabb, and Hank Farmer. For what? For destruction of the Territorial Enterprise Office. Intent to do bodily harm. I won't even bring up interfering with freedom of the press. But they didn't have anything to do with smashing up the newspaper office. Now, what makes you so sure of that? Because I just came from the people who did. Prentice has a lot of friends in this town who are pretty upset with what you wrote about him. Good, decent citizens. Oh, decent, yeah. I use words, they use rocks. I've got a subpoena for you. Prentice is suing you for libel. Ten thousand dollars? Is that all? Well, we'll uh, I'll, I'll talk to Prentice. I think I can straighten it out. There's no way we can straighten it out with him unless he signs a full confession. Now, don't look so worried. How can I lose to a darn fool who thinks I have ten thousand dollars? A libel suit of H.V. Prentice versus the Nevada Territorial Enterprise and Samuel Clemens' editor for $10,000 is now in session. It's going to take a long time to pay that off at $5 a week. Mr. Clemens, the Territorial Enterprise is also liable. Well, now we've got some visitors. Overnight miners, McNabb, Farmer, Mulligan, McGee, and Williams. They're a real American success story. Are the attorneys ready to proceed with the picking of a jury? We are, Your Honor. We are, Your Honor. Mr. Caldwell, are you acquainted with the defendant, Mr. Samuel Clemens? I know him. I met him when he first came to Virginia City. You know him well? No, not very well. Have you read the vicious, slanderous story? Objection. Against Slander has not been proved. Objection to sustained. Uh, I'll rephrase it. Uh, have you read any of the allegations against Mr. Prentice printed in the Territorial Enterprise? Pretty hard not to. If you didn't read them, you heard them all over town. Sam Clemens called Prentice a thief and a lot more. Excuse, you missed that down. Well, that's all right. I would want him on the jury anyway. Of course I read this story. How else would I know what's going on in town? Your Honor, where are you going to find anybody in Virginia City who doesn't know about the story? Unless he's deaf or blind or nitwit. Mr. Clemens, you're out of order. Sam, I hired Osgood because he's the best lawyer in town. Why don't you let him handle things? It kind of worries me. He's not like most lawyers. 
keeps his hands in his own pockets. Your Honor, would you inform the defendant that it is customary to select jurors with no previous knowledge of the case being tried? Your Honor, the law says I'm entitled to a jury of my peers. That means people who can read. Mr. Clemens, I warn you. Either you confine your editorials to your newspaper, or I'll hold you in contempt. I'll tell you another thing. Ah, Mr. Clemens, now that's enough. Mr. Merrick, are you prepared to proceed with the case? I am, Your Honor. I would like to call Mr. Samuel Clemens to the stand, please. Too bad I'm not being tried for murder. Based on the record around here, I'd be a lot more sure of an acquittal. <laughs> Mr. Clemens, will you merely answer the counsel's question? Well, I'll try, Your Honor, but sometimes things just sort of leak out of me, like the truth. Your Honor, I would like to introduce into evidence the March 6th issue of the Territorial Enterprise. In the front page story written by Mr. Clemens here, my client, the plaintiff, is outrageously implicated in fraud and no less than five murders. Yeah, well, now about that, Your Honor, there might have been more. Five was all I could put my finger on. Mr. Clemens, the court will not tolerate any further accusations against Mr. Prentice. Now, Mr. Clemens, in your pre-trial deposition here, you state that the basis for that whole pack of lies was the babblings of a man you met in the Silver Dollar Saloon. Now, hold on a minute. He wasn't babbling. He was a concerned citizen who was worried about what's going on in this town. Well, may we have the name of this public-spirited citizen? I can't give you that. Mr. Clemens, are you afraid that if you gave us the name of this man, your whole story would be exposed as a tissue of lies? Oh, there's a lot more to it than that. Now, ever since the early Egyptians were writing on papyrus, it's been an unwritten law that a newspaper man doesn't have to reveal where he gets his story. You seem to be quite an expert on the unwritten laws, but not the written ones. Oh, it stands to reason nobody's going to tell a story to a newspaper man in confidence if he can get yanked into court the next day. Mr. Clements, even if you refuse to give us the name of this man, don't you suppose that this very concerned citizen would show up here on his own voluntarily? Not if he knows where his head ought to be. The moment he came through that door, his life wouldn't be worth a plug nickel. Mr. Clemens, then your entire defense is based on the hearsay of a man that you refuse to name, if he exists at all. I don't need anybody to back me up. Why, when my lawyer gets Mr. Prentice and his cronies up here on the stand, even you might be a little embarrassed. Your Honor, would you please remind the defendant and his learned counsel that Mr. Prentice and the other men named in that outrageous story are not on trial here. They do not have to testify as witnesses. Objection, Your Honor. I must call these men. <sighs> Mr. Clemens wrote this story by himself. I don't see he has any right to ask for help. Objection denied. No more questions, Mr. Clemens. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. What is your verdict? We think Mr. Prentice is entitled to the $10,000. Some of us think it should have been more. I have something to add to the jury's verdict. Mr. Clemens has made a lot of speeches about the rights of the press. Well, citizens have rights too. The court orders him to print an immediate retraction in the next issue of the Territorial Enterprise. Court is adjourned. It's no surprise he didn't have a chance of winning without that man's testimony. Good talk of that. Oz good talk of that. He just won't listen to anybody. That man likes being in trouble. He enjoys it. Yeah. Well, I hope you're proud of your brilliant young editor. Tell him he'd better be careful about what he prints, though, because next time, it won't be a libel suit. Hey, Mr. Cartwright. You know that picture of... Justice holding up the scales blindfolded? Well, I finally know where they got that idea from. Virginia City.
drink to celebrate the wisdom of the courts. No, thank you. Well, all right. I'll save it for a man who appreciates good whiskey. I assume you've been in touch with Mr. Goodman. Well, I figured he was entitled to know. I sent him a wire. I hope you apologize for your strange selection of editors. I hope you explain to him that the good seed went wrong despite all your tender ministrations. Now, I explained that Osgood was appealing the decision, and that if he loses, I'll be responsible for the 10,000. Now, how did they ever pack so much nobility into one man? Sam, that sounds like whiskey talking. I only wish it were true. What you hear is outrage, laced with small parts of alcohol. Well, I think I'd better come by and take a look at that retraction for tomorrow's paper. Oh, sure. Here it is. Fresh from my fertile mind. I hope it meets with your approval. It uh, falls just short of bestowing sainthood. The editor of the Territorial Enterprise wishes to publicly apologize for impugning the reputation of a beloved public servant, H.V. Prentice, and such fine pillars of the community as Jack McNabb, Hank Farmer. Sam, let's lay it on a bit too thick. Well, I figure if you're going to be a bootlicker, you might as well go all the way. I don't think the idea is to make them a laughing stock. No, you don't, Mr. Cartwright. You may own a lot of acres, but you don't rewrite Sam Clemens. The editor of the Territorial Enterprise apologizes for bringing unjust allegations against H.V. Prentice, the government of Sayre, and such citizens as Jack McNabb, Hank Farmer, Joe McGee, Billy Mulligan, Jack Williams, we hope they will accept this apology without rancor. Better? I think it's closer to what the court had in mind, yes. Well, thank you very much for coming all the way into town to check up on me. Sam, I'm not against you. If Prentice is guilty, we'll do anything we can to help you prove it. But in the meantime, people keep disappearing. Well, thanks for dropping by. I'll see you tomorrow. Sure, you keep that watchful eye. Sam, I better have the retraction if I'm going to reset the front page. Campbell, you know where a man's conscience is located? It's in his stomach. And if he does something that he feels is wrong, it makes him sick. Sam, we're going to miss the deadline. You never mind the retraction. You print that. Eh? Oh, Sam. No. No, we can't print this. Campbell, you're going to print it, or I'm going to print it. Uh, uh, now, Sam, we're going to be in real trouble. You know what the judge ordered. You never mind the judge. We'll worry about him tomorrow. Because tonight, we're newspaper men. This is very strong medicine. A good dose of truth really settles a man's stomach. You shouldn't have done this, Sam. You shouldn't have riled Judge Hale. He wasn't on my side when he wasn't riled. Well, the enterprise will be closed until Mr. Goodman gets back and settles things. Most of you should get your jobs back in about a week. Come on, Riverboat. Look, now, there's no need for long faces. People are always trying to fight the press. They only win temporarily. Mm, Mr. Clemens, what am I going to tell my ma? Well, Petey, you tell your ma that you printed the most important story of the year and so you earned an unexpected vacation. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot, Mr. Clemens. Well, gentlemen, what do you say we celebrate my remarkable rise from affluence to poverty?
corner, Bert. Oh, Sam, I hear you're having a little trouble. Newspaper shot out from under you? No, oh, no. Just went lame for a while. How about a round of drinks for everybody? Put it on my tab. I'm sorry, Sam. No more tabs. Not when you're out of work. Yeah, I'd settle five cents on a dollar with these tabs. Oh, Bert, I'm real disappointed in you. Nobody's closer to human suffering than a bartender. Now, if you don't want to bring a disgrace to your profession... Bert, put it on my tab. It's going to be a pleasure to buy Mr. Clemens' last drink. Tell him Well, now, don't extend yourself, McNabb. Like it's no trouble at all, Clemens. Uh, now, I know it's not smart to go looking for trouble with a newspaper editor. But then, uh, I don't have to worry about that now, do I? I mean, you're out of a job. You're good help. Stand up. Stand up like a man. See you shoot that. Like the way you've been shooting off your mouth. You got about three seconds. You got longer than that. Nab, you got some beef, why don't you take it up with the sheriff legally? Still protecting your bright little boy, huh? Well, we can wait. Yeah. Big Daddy ain't gonna always be around, no siree. Come on. Sure, I'm glad you dropped by, Mr. Cartwright. But you couldn't have picked a better time. Bert, a round of drinks on Mr. Cartwright. No drinks. Now, don't be upset. I wouldn't let McNabb get under my skin. Why didn't you print that retraction you showed me last night? Well, I got to thinking about it. I didn't figure it was right to confuse people. So you just shut down the paper? Yeah, temporarily. I think a newspaper ought to shut down if it can't tell the truth. Might make a better general store. What am I supposed to tell Mr. Goodman? You tell him you made a mistake. You thought running a newspaper was kind of like a pink tea party. You step on somebody's toes with a story, you're supposed to curtsy and say, I'm sorry. I didn't say you were wrong. I just asked you to wait. And in the meantime, I'm supposed to glorify Prentice and a pack of killers? Now, I couldn't do that when I was a printer's devil! I'm sorry if I've endangered the Cartwright position as a sacred cow in this community, but if you don't like it, you should have gotten yourself another editor. One who can write about the birth of a foal on the Ponderosa. That way you wouldn't have any trouble at all. Very funny. Well, these gentlemen don't seem to understand newspaper men. Why don't we have a drink with somebody who does? Uh, Sam, what am I going to do with these? Bert, you save them for a better day. Well, I could have told you you couldn't talk any sense into them. Well, we sure could buy a lot of cattle with all that money. Boys, I'd like you to follow Sam. Keep an eye on him. Why? What for? It's just going to be one saloon after another. McNabb's over there. Still waiting to get a crack at him. To see that he doesn't. Now, where are you going? I'll, uh, I'll find you later. Hey, Bert, uh, give me a whiskey, will you? A little something to calm me down after the fracas? No, <laughs> that wasn't anything, just a friendly argument. Well, if that was friendly, I sure don't want to be around when you people get mad. No, really, it wasn't anything. Oh, I, uh, I came back to, I want to pay Sam's tabs. All of them? You know, Mr. Cartwright, old Sam does a lot of talking. When he gets to talking, he gets powerful thirsty. Fifteen dollars, seventeen dollars, all these big parties? 
Well, no, not all of them. Some of them are for two people. Now, that one for $17, that goes back uh, Thursday or Friday, I think. Old Sam stood there, talked for hours with this miner. That fella seemed real upset about something. You recall who it was? Mm, no, uh, I don't think I'd remember. Sound like uh, Hodges. Uh, oh, no, I remember. It was Hutchins. Dan Hutchins was his name. Dan Hutchins. Totally so, with you? Oh, I got the total exactly. It's 78.25. Oh, uh, Sam always adds 10% for the tip. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that should cover everything. Mm, thank you, Mr. Cartwright. I sure hope this worth it to you. I think it is. He was an honest man, full of great sorrow, though, and a bit confused. You see, he was from Arkansas, and as everybody knows, his whole state was destroyed by mosquitoes. His delusion was that the Arkansas mosquito was the most ornery of all mosquitoes. He's ornery. But he isn't nearly as honorary as a Lake Province mosquito. I know one of my best friends who never lies told me. Two Lake Province mosquitoes can whip a dog. Four of them can hold a man down. They'll kill him if he doesn't scream for help soon enough. They butcher him, is the phrase my friend used. He told me he'd seen him try to vote. <laughs> Well, I admit it did put a little strain on my imagination. He did modify it a bit. He said that he wasn't exactly sure of the particulars, but he was sure. He was sure that he'd seen them around the poles a few times, canvassing. A pilot, a riverboat pilot, once told me a story. I know it's true, because he never lied to me. I think we're getting back to the alligator. I could never manage to go down the river without running on an alligator. He used to be able to steer right to the best alligator water and slide right on through. Without ever hitting an alligator, he seldom even woke one up. A thousand dollars a month. <sighs> they paid that man fifteen hundred dollars. He had a raise. But it was worth it. Good night, boys. Enjoyed your company. Not as much as two rattlers. Almost like all good Americans, I reserve the right to pick my own sleeping partners. Uh, you just get some rest. Don't worry about us. Pretend we're not here. Hey, we'll just hang around for a little while, eh? Look, I don't need your protection. Besides, nobody's come near me except you two. That's the way Pa wants it. I talked myself blue in the face to get Pa to listen, and, and, and now suddenly Pa decides he's all worried about me. Well, I don't need his help. Okay, you get a good night's sleep. You'll feel a lot better in the morning. There are a few things harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. See, people are complaining. You're probably keeping them all awake. Well, maybe you can get them out of here. Now, they're homestead. Sam. That miner told you about Prentice. Was it Dan Hutchins? 
Why? Now, come on now, Sam. Was he your informant? What difference does it make? Anyway, why should I tell you what I wouldn't tell the court? Because if it was Dan Hutchins, then your story was true. Somebody killed him before I could get to him. Can't we stop off for a bit of the hair of the dog? Sam, just as soon as the judge gives us the court order, you can have all the drinks you want. Mr. Cartwright, that judge isn't going to help us. Not after he ruled against me. He'd be thrown off the bench. Or behaving like a human being. Well, I can handle Judge Hale. Now, you got to remember the name of the miner who disappeared. Didn't Hutchins tell you his name? Yeah, he mentioned it several times. A foreign name. Well, what is it? Well, a drink could jog my wits. Well, just a minute now. Come on, this way. Is it a French name? Or Italian? No, it's nothing like that. It started with a B. That's it. Jan Boros. You sure? Sure as I'll ever be at this hour. Boros. Ben, what you're asking is highly unusual. The one thing any judge is always afraid of is the unusual. He hasn't got a precedent to go on. He just wraps himself in his robes and disappears. I don't feel I have the right to interfere with the public mails. What'd I tell you? <clears throat> Look, Dan Hutchins was the only witness that could have corroborated Sam's story. He was killed. He was murdered because somebody was afraid of what he might say. Maybe his murder had nothing to do with that. Maybe his mule drew a bead on him. If you'd have stood up in court and given us Hudson's name the way you should have, maybe this wouldn't have happened. No, he'd have been murdered a lot sooner. <sighs> There's no point in going into bygones, is there? Now, all we're asking for is a court order to go through the unclaimed letters at the post office. It's the only way we can prove that a miner by the name of Jan Boris disappeared. What makes you so sure there's a letter? Well, Dan Hutchins told Sam that Boris, when he made his rich strike, wrote a letter to his wife, saying that he was going to send for her and for the kids. Now, the odds are she would have written them back. That letter's probably just sitting there waiting. you will do anything to back up Sam. There's murder and claim jumping involved. All right, Ben. I'll make a deal with you. Your lawyer's appealing my decision. That's not going to make me look good in Carson City. I'll give you the court order. But if you don't find that letter, you drop the appeal. <clears throat> well, uh, if we don't find any real evidence, you got yourself a deal. Good thing you came when you did, Mr. Cartwright. We were going to send a lot of this stuff back. I don't keep anything over six months. Here's the last of them. Thank you. You got anything? Well, there's nothing near even close to, um, Burroughs. Are you sure you got that name right? Yeah, that's the right name. Whether it was Jones or Thompson, I got a fistful of those. Well, nothing here. Thanks for letting us waste your time. Thank you. Bert, make that round of drinks on me. You mean on your tab? No, I'll pay for it in cash. I always keep a little bit around for emergencies. Sort of a sinking fund. I wouldn't believe that if I didn't see it with my own eyes. <laughs> to you, Mr. Cartwright, any man deserves your respect. Hmm. Well, for one, we're coming up with a plan that didn't work? Well, Mr. Cartwright, I had you pegged all wrong. I knew you were a decent sort of fella, and you'd give a square deal to the hands on the Ponderosa, keep a watchful eye on things in Virginia City, in a fatherly sort of way. Anything to keep up that shiny Cartwright reputation, but you're a lot better than that. You'll plow right in and get a little dirty if it's something important. Sam, that's quite a speech you just made. Well, I just want you to know I'm grateful. You made a lot of enemies around here in Virginia City, all on account of me. Yeah. H.V. Prentice isn't about to invite you to supper. No. No, and Judge Hale isn't exactly fond of you either. Well, he'll feel a whole lot better about it when I tell him I'm dropping the appeal. Let's have another round of drinks and figure out how to beat the old goat. No, I can't do that. Sam, you're a bigger fool than I am. And when you pick up your mail, do you go to the post office? No, I come right here to my favorite saloon. That's right. Bert, can I 
see that mail? Uh, there's nothing here for Sam, Mr. Cartwright. Nobody be right you at the Silver Dollar. Yes, true, but I have a court order here. Give me permission to look over any unclaimed mail for Jen Burris. Oh, I'll take your word for it, Mr. Cartwright. Let's see now. No, oh, here's one from Olathe, Kansas. Jan, my dearest, it was wonderful to read the good news. The children are very excited. They tell everyone their father has found the richest mine in the state of Nevada. Jimmy had a cold. It's taken a long time, but I never gave up hope. You were wearing my wedding band, and I knew it would bring good luck. All right, now let's go over and rub Judge Hale's nose in it. You're going to have to be very nice to Judge Hale, Sam. Yeah, you're going to have to tie and gag him if you expect him to do it. Why do I have to be so gosh darn polite? We got the letter. This letter doesn't prove any murder. You're going to have to get permission from Judge Hale to, to dig up Jan Boris's body. How are we going to find it? There are five unmarked graves. Only one with the woman's wedding band. Let's go. before the whole town comes nosing around to see what we're up to. You can't make it too fast for me. Where do you want to start? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Open up that one, boys. There's nothing to be afraid of. Ben, I think this is a waste of time. If he was wearing the ring like she said, they'd have taken it off of him if it was worth anything. I... I doubt is worth very much. Sure takes a lot of digging. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Again, no, uh, no ring. This could be a bad idea. We're not through yet. All right, come on, boys, keep moving. Long enough. 
this is the last one. Don't worry about me, Pa. I'm fine. Kid's real brave, or he's a great liar. One of them, I think it was McNabb. He's hurt bad enough, he shouldn't be hard to find. Sonny, fill up those graves! It doesn't figure somebody ought to be here. Doc Webb's too old to go out on calls at this hour. Maybe there was an emergency. Well, if there's an emergency, you wouldn't call Doc Webb out of town. He'd never make it. Let's keep looking. Nav's not over at Doc Baldwin's. Doc got mad at me for waking him up. We left Jamie off over at the hotel. Good. Well, there are only two doctors in town. He beat one of the others, he's not up there. Well, maybe he just didn't hit him as hard as I thought. I can't do anything without light. You better do it without light. Our God sakes, man, let him get the bullet out. Don't worry, Jack, it won't take much longer. What did you find out in the saloons? Nobody knows anything about McNabb or any of his friends. Did you check the back rooms? Sheriff, I check places you never even heard of. You mind if I sit down? Oh, it's no use. You better get some rest. I'll set up a roadblock. Oh, get me a drink, will you? Later. Oh, I, I can't hold out much longer. Take it easy, Jack. Hurting. Oh. Give oh. me a few more minutes. They're about ready to leave. Doc. I'm all right. On your feet. Come on. Oh. You're going to tell us all about Prentice and the others. You're going to play for this all by yourself. I'll tell you anything. Anything at all. Only let him get the bullet out. And then all we have to do now is round up Mr. Prentice. Oh. I'll let you take care of this. I've got things to do. Was worth it. You sure you won't stay with the Enterprise? Can't be a general, then be demoted back into the ranks. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Cartwright. It's been nice knowing you. Even if I did raise your blood pressure a little. Sam, what are you going to do? 
Well, I guess I'll poke my nose in other people's business, like I always do. Then I'll write about it, and maybe somebody will be interested. Well, I'll see you. Hey, where's your bags? I'll give you a hand with them. No, I always travel light. Most people think I'm smoking too much, but I'm just moving. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, I almost forgot. I have a story for you. I haven't got time to tell it to you, but maybe you'll take this. Thanks, Mr. Clemens. <laughs> the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County. Well, this isn't your story. It says it's by Mark Twain. Well, a writer has to have a lot of names, so we'll be protected. Hey, <laughs> Better get going. I'll see you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good luck. Come on, are you coming? Bye, Sam. What? You'll get used to it. Drinking can be a big help. You're a lot more apt to get the truth out of a man in his cups than a sober citizen. How do you know this is the truth? Newspaper man has to have a nose for things like that, Mr. Cartwright. If he doesn't, he ought to buy himself a pick and shovel. Now, I was told he was a very reliable citizen. All right. Who is this reliable citizen? Never mind who. Anyway, you told me that an old miner staked out a claim right next to his. Seems this old geezer had struggled all the way through all the rat holes in the West, and he finally struck it rich. He got so excited, he wrote his wife to come on with the kids. Then he went over to Mr. Prentice at the assay office to register his claim. It's the last anybody ever saw of him. And a couple of days later, that same claim was filed in the name of a Mr. Jack McNabb. Jack McNabb? He, he's a dealer with the Lucky Nugget, and he works at all. A lot of other interesting claims this year, Mr. Cartwright. Billy Mulligan, Joe McGee, Hank Farmer, Jack Williams. Now, not one of those men would know gold if he ran across it in his own teeth. Well, it still doesn't implicate Prentice. I did a lot more checking as a reporter. Would you say that H.V. Prentice was a big spender? He's careful with his money. Careful? Now, isn't a man alive who can remember when he bought anybody a drink? He... Prentice have filed rich claims. Sam Prentice has been a respected member of this community for more than 20 years. Are you saying he's involved in claim jumping and murder? Well, involved is a kind of fancy word, but it covers it. I sound that can't be true. Just can't be true. Now, how, how, how could you print a story like this? And, well, this will ruin Goodman. You, you better have the proof. <laughs> Somebody must be getting a little touchy. Well, it's nice to know people are reading the paper. in other people. Bert, hold Mr. Cartwright's drink. You know, Sam, that story you wrote for the Enterprise got this whole town turned upside down. Bert, maybe you ought to tell Mr. Cartwright about that. See, I used to have a cabin on Jackass Hill. He thinks there's some connection. <laughs> Where did you get that information for this story? Right over there. The man standing...
myself, Ben. I'm still not sure I ought to take this trip. Oh, come on now, Goodman. You asked me for the money to buy a new press, and you've been running hot and cold ever since. <laughs> a new press isn't going to do me any good if I get back here and there's no newspaper. Oh, you'd only be gone, what, less than a week. I just don't like the idea of turning it over to some young reporter who is brash and hot-headed. And... Now, now, look, I... I... Well, I guess I was born modest. Oh, yeah. You know, not all over, but in spots. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, why don't we celebrate on it? Why don't we have a drink? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll have a little short one. Yeah. Well, I only drink myself to prevent toothache. I never had one, but I don't want to take any chances. Hey, Campbell. Hey. How about running over to the Silver Dollar and uh, bringing us back a bottle of whiskey? Oh. Oh, uh, what will I use for... Oh, I'm sure Mr. Cartwright has the money handy. All right, Mr. Campbell, here. That ought to do it. I'll bring you back your change. I'll uh, bring back the best whiskey. Uh, for Mr. Cartwright. Oh, naturally. Naturally. <laughs> Sam, I sure appreciate your talent with the bottle. How are you doing as an editor? Well, I think I'm doing all right, considering it's my first day. What's this? How to steal with government help. It's another one of your funny stories, Sam. About times somebody around these parts started asking questions of Mr. H.V. Prentice, a distinguished government affair. It's kind of strange that in less than a year, five new graves have been added to the Virginia City Boot Hill. Some awfully good friends of Mr. P. No, he's young and he's cocky, but I think he has every right to be. He writes a whole lot better than most people I've come across, and he's a good newspaper man. Well, I don't know about newspaper, Pa, but he sure tells great stories. <laughs> he sure does. Well, now, Smiley used to keep this little beast in a little lattice box. Every once in a while, he'd fetch him into town and lay for a bed. One day, a fella, now, he was a stranger in camp, he was. He saw him with his little box, and he said, Say, what do you got there in that there box? Well, Smiley, he just sort of indifferent like, says, Well, could be a parrot. Then again, it could be a canary, maybe. But it ain't. It's only just a frog. Well, uh, Sam. Mr. Cartwright, Jamie. Mr. Hi. Hey, Petey. How you How doing? Good to see you. Thank you. Tell him about the frog. Uh, well, uh, we'll get back to him. Right. Listen, you yeah, make sure that these papers get to the proper saloon. See you later. <laughs> OK, Petey. Jamie, my friend, I hope you've been taking all my advice seriously. Now, always obey your pa when he's present. <laughs> and always do right, because it amazes most people. <laughs> well, I try. <laughs> well, I got something to show you. What's that? How's it look? Pretty official? Samuel Clemens, editor pro tem. Yeah, looks pretty official. Kind of surprises me, though, Sam. Knowing you, I figured you'd be using much bigger.